of a group of coaches that we've got in Glasgow that's called the Glasgow Endurance Group, I think that's what we call it. Um, and our aim is really to try and improve endurance athletics um, in Glasgow and, and across the, the west of Scotland. So one of the things that we do is try to encourage athletes to train together. We might ask you about what you think about that at some point. Um, so we run the Glasgow Endurance Sessions on a Saturday um, and that's really worked out well to try and improve the standard of training. Um, and the other thing we do is try and do some coach education whenever we get the opportunity. So we've been kind of cheeky tonight and we've taken the opportunity to ask Ian Stewart and John Chaplin along to do this Endurance Seminar for us. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'll, I'll do some introduction and I'll probably have to refer to my notes because both of the, the guys here are so distinguished, they've got big long lists of achievements um, and I need to um, refer to my notes just to remember them all and also I'm not really from the era as well. So, uh, <laughs> 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 but after having looked at the books, Eid Stewart is okay. one of Scotland's, well, the best probably athletes that we've had, um, having won a uh, Commonwealth goal, um, World Cross Country, um, yeah. European Champions, broken the British record four times, um, and also won the European Championships, have I forgotten anything else? Olympic bronze. Olympic bronze. <laughs> that was his worst race of his life. <laughs> and, and it's very strange that I have to, to forget that because my partner was actually, um, his mum was on the way to hospital <laughs> just as you were about to run and his dad wouldn't let him let her go until the race was over. <laughs> so there is a family connection here, of course, I've forgotten that as well. Um, and um, also broke the British record for five times in 10k and 10 mile. I must have had the British record because I spare 45 minutes there. Um, John Chaplin was a sprinter. That's right. Yeah. Um, what was your favourite event? Well, I did the poor physical exercise, but as a quarter mile around 44, 9, 10, 200 meters. And then he has been um, a very distinguished coach at Washington State University, having something like 30 Olympians that have gone through the... There's a few bodies. Yeah. And also he's been the chief faculty coach for the Olympic team in 2000 <coughs> um, in Sydney, and also you're still involved in that as well. I'm still the chairman, I run the trials and those kind of things. Okay. And Ian, of course, is head of endurance in UK athletics as well. So um, it's a great opportunity to get have a chance to pick these guys' brains. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll do it in the sort of tradition of question time. So if folk have got questions, then we'll put it to the panel. Admittedly, you know, the panel's not as big as we usually have in question time, but um, it, I think that's... It, 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 it might be better yeah. in my case. Start. Maybe I can <coughs> explain what my philosophy is, so they have some idea. And Ian does too. It, yeah. mm -hmm. <clears throat> the runners that I had were runners like Henry Rauno and uh, Peter Kowich and Jerry Lindgren and Career and, and uh, Samson Gong. These are all the world record holders, Olympic champions, and two world record holders in the steeple, one Olympic champion, two two guys who are in the total the, the, the world record time and the second fastest time ever in the five and the same in the ten. Um, my philosophy was being a sprinter, and I watched in college. As I had no intention of being a coach. I got a master's degree in philosophy. But uh, <coughs> I, it, as things happen, I ended up coaching anyway. And uh, what we, what, the philosophy we had was quite simple. We trained at 5,000 as a college team and ran 15s down and 10s off of it. And the idea is that it's quality work, not quantity. No one ran during the season more than 40 to 60, and maybe 60 the maximum out of the season. Uh, you have two thresholds, aerobic and anaerobic threshold. You've got to push them both all the time. Uh, we only came on the track twice a day. That was a hard day. We had a seven, eight mile run in a, in a canyon like Kenya in, in the hills of Washington. It drops 2,000 feet in the Snake Canyon back, and I'm interested what they run the last mile and a half, two miles in. And then they're slightly tired, and then they run. We start with three again, so we're running five times a thousand, either straight or in a place where you surge. <clears throat> On the basis, and the philosophy is based, you want to put your opponent in a position, any choice he or she makes the wrong choice. So you got three things in your arsenal. You can sprint, you can surge, and you can lead. If you don't like to lead, you always lead in practice. If you don't like to surge, give you more surging drills. If you don't like to sprint, because you cheat on the rest of the stuff. You know, and that's 
So I philosophically come from that kind of position. You might tell yours, and then they can ask some questions. Well, I'm fairly <coughs> old school, and I think it's fairly wide knowledge that we've written the endurance strategy which is it's an evolving document and um, wh where we are is there's, there's a lot of running and volume not dissimilar to what John has described but more of it these days plus the altitude camps that we have now set up are a, a major factor for us and we've now got to a stage <coughs> that, that if you to me, mind, mind you if you ignore it you know, it, yeah, it is actually a peril today, because 98 to 99% of the world's best endurance runners, from 800 to the marathon, whether people like it or not, and there are coaches in Britain that think the 800 doesn't have to go up there, you've got to, you know, ignore that really at your peril, big time, because I've had the same discussion with Norman Paul, who has totally the opposite view to me, and he thinks Rimmer's had a great year, Rimmer's got to find three and a half seconds. His main component, uh, opponent, Rudisha, is at I-10, all the time we're there. He doesn't come from altitude, but he lives and trains there now, all the time we're there. Americans are doing that now, so, too. And you know, you've, right. got to, you've, you've got to start looking at that. <coughs> that. Our philosophy, my philosophy, is very, very simple on this. And I think it's, I think most of the British coaches, especially some of the guys probably looking around this room, the age of some of the guys, you've actually forgotten what you know. And you've sort of listened to this less is more. Well, it, uh, the only time less is more in my philosophy is 10 days out before a major championships when you're backing up. That's the only time I feel like less is more. The rest of the time is what can you do and how much can you do it at and what, what pace you can do this stuff at. And, and you've got to build up over a period of time. I mean, last year Mo Farah averaged about 130 miles a week. Simple as that. That's just the baseline of what we were doing with Mo and Thompson and the people that were successful in, in Barcelona. And, and we've only moved 30 degrees to the right. The oil tanker's got to turn 180 degrees all the way around the other direction. So we've got a huge task on our hands and a long way to go. And we won't crack it in the, the two or three years that I've been given to do this. It's going to be five or six years on. Because it's a philosophy that we've got to get all the juniors that you coach. They've got to understand that this is what you've got to do to make this level. And the more of those kids we can take up there, we start to try to get juniors up there just to see Mo, but see all the Kenyan guys running up in I-10. And actually all they're doing is going out running. To start with, they just go out running. They don't do any sessions or whatever. And my other big problem with it is, our coaches don't have any patience. It's almost, where do I fit into this picture? It's like, it's all about me. Well, I'm sorry, no, it's not. If you're going to average 18 weeks at about 100 to 120 mile a week, there's a lot of time they're just going to be out there running without your supervision. But that base training work needs to be done before we can do <coughs> these big track sessions. And you, we're trying to sort of break that down. And in the two years that I've started on this project, we're getting more and more people turn around. And, and if you're coming to the meet tomorrow, take a look at Marina Coro. She started, she's moved off that stuff she has been doing all her life and came to Kenya before Christmas. And I've been saying to her for 18 months, you've got to stop doing this crap. You've got to stop doing this sprint. Well, you've got to do some running. Because you look like a 400 meter runner. You're spending so much time in the gym. In five weeks, we took two and a half kilos off her just by getting her out running. If you see her tomorrow, she actually looks like a runner now. Or like one of our runners should look like. And if you talk to her about it, never wants to go to a sprint camp ever again. And that remains to be seen how she runs tomorrow <laughs> and how she races this indoor season. But potentially, I think she could easily be our best eight of the meter run. So that's basically where I'm coming from. Okay, so we've got quite a few controversial or interesting <laughs> topics there. Altitude, volume. Yeah, and, and I, I, I agree with him in the sense of our like, season. What you want. And, I, and I do agree you have to do altitude training now. My point was that... Uh, I, I tend to think, though, once you start your competitive season, that it, you, and, and as long as you're, we're not really talking about a different thing, off season you need more rain. Yeah. But the point is that once you get into competitive season, and, you know, and, 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 and no matter what you're running after you've done your base work, it has, to, you have to manage, you have two thresholds. And if you're not pushing them, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, you're in trouble. 
you know, because you're not going to get any better. You've got to be pushing both thresholds whenever you do it all the time. And, and John's absolutely right, because when the year of Beijing, Mo Farah and, and Ricky Sims asked me if I'd take a look at his training, and then he was asking me what I would do. And really, I wasn't even thinking of doing this. I mean, Neil asked me 12 months later if I'd take this endurance project on. And I said, show me what you've done. And to John's point, what he'd actually done, he was doing a lot of running, doing a lot of volume. So if you've got a page, he, he, he was running 100 mile a week plus down here. But if you saw the track sessions he was doing, they were volume too. And that just replicated that. And that doesn't help. And that doesn't help. And he just couldn't run fast. And, and I argue with him over. I said to him, I'll tell you what. I said, I'll, I'll come to St. Mary's and I'll give you a real dead simple, what I'd call a bread and butter session. He said, what is it? I said, I want you to run six times 800 meters with a three minute recovery and average two minutes. And him and Ricky Sims just laughed. I said, okay. I said, I hear what you're saying, but I'm coming. I said, but I'm just telling you now. I'll be averaging the recoveries as well as I'll be averaging the runs. That's right. You will get three minutes. Or two minutes, 55 seconds is what you're going to get. He couldn't run two minutes. He'd come off the track even broken up. He'd average about two, four. Now, 40 years ago, I could do that session for the third session of the day in about 156. 40 years ago. <laughs> and I said to him, well, what's wrong with this picture here? You know. Yeah, we do the same thing, and the reason I say thousands is because when you're running, I'm not talking about the half, now, I'm talking about five to ten. There's a clock at both in major competitions, there's a clock at each 200 meters. Yeah. You can't break anybody by running one, try to break them in 400 meters, but you can over a thousand. So when they practice, they would start, maybe, let's say you start the season running three minutes for the thousand and three minutes rest. You, when you can run and you keep dropping, it, it, then it says, and so you, when they can run three minutes at three minutes rest, then you drop it so it is, uh, excuse me, they can run three minutes at two minutes rest, then you drop it back so they run 250, and you go back to three minutes, and you keep bringing it down. And so, and, and, and sometimes you run, and, but, you're, but the point is you run hard in the morning, six, seven miles, so that you're slightly tired because that's what the race is like. It's like all of that. And, and then you, so then you, you do it that way. And then we would run maybe, so in, by the season, by the end of the year, we could run 235 with two minutes rest and we could run five of those. And, but, you don't, but for a surgeon grill, you don't do it that way. You run the first one equal, say like 62, 62, 32, you know, 31. Then you go to your two minutes rest when you, when you, you get to that stage. And then you run the next one, 40, 35, 35, 30 in sprint. Then you drop right back and run a steady one. Then you do another one in surgeon grill. Because the point is, when the guy goes and leaves, and Liam decides to break for me, he's not going to say, oh, by the way, John, I'm going to do it for 500 meters. So you better be able to do it, and you better be able to drop it, because if you don't do it, you're going to be in oxygen debt. And then your answer is stop and let it come back to rest, and that doesn't work well in the race. No, that's right. And then some of the stuff that we've done, I mean, we've, we've taken what we consider to be the best of the old, yeah. and we've brought in the best of the new. We've got, obviously, Barry Fudge, who probably most of you have been in Scotland know Barry. We've got Andy Jones, who, who I consider to be two of the best physiologists in the world at what we want them to do, endurance running. We've insisted, or I've insisted, that everybody that's involved in our program, from our doctors to our physios, everybody's got to have an endurance background. Because if you don't understand us people sitting in this room, you know, I don't need the physiologists from the All Blacks or the nutritionists, because I don't want my guys looking like that. I want you to understand what we're looking for. Do you so take I want blood samples? Yep. Okay. Everything. So if you're doing that and you're running it, that's what he means by going to the new. You know, the old days you put a guy on an oxygen uptake test, or you take a look at it, maybe take a core muscle sample. But you couldn't afford to haul them around the world. You couldn't right. afford to get those good people because you didn't have the money to bring them in. But now you see, you can go. We, anybody who comes with us now to altitude, especially for the first time, has to go to Loughborough, has to be tested by Barry. And then Barry's out in front of our, or he's out, to, or Andy Jones is, and we're monitoring everybody. Before Barcelona, with, with people like Thompson and Mo, who were doubling up in, in big events, we had a recovery program. The whole thing was set up. People won't believe the detail we went into just to pull off Barcelona. 
Um, you know, we had altitude tents put in their rooms. By the time they came straight down, they were only in, they were only in Barcelona 24 hours before the 10,000. They came straight down from Ramo, straight in, altitude tents, ready to go. That's what you have to And we, we told them all the press people in, that, in the office, Claire Furlong, when they come off this track, I said, holy hell, we're going to break loose because they're going to do unbelievable things. You've got 20 minutes in the press zone. We're going to take them out. Got to get recovery drinks in them. We need the physios on them. We need ice baths to them. We're going to back to the hotel, back in the altitude tents. If the press won't, come to the hotel tomorrow. They'll do a press conference then. But it won't be at the track. And we were very strict on all of that. So that's us taking the best of the new and mixing it with what we consider now to be the best of the old. Because whether we like it or not, there are more Africans. You know, there's, there's people that are living in altitude. Paula would be a classic example of that. And we have to take notice of that. And it's not that the African, the Kenyans, or the Ethiopians are physiologically any better than us. And in the words of Barry Fudge, which is why well, I have a lot of respect for Barry, who spent a lot of time in Kenya and Ethiopia, he said, they just work twice as hard, and they do it at altitude. If you go and do the same thing, you'll get a similar result. Yeah, because they're born there, so they start with that. And you've got to get yourself to that, or you're in trouble, because their, bo their body just has more blood, blood vessels, they have more oxygen. It's, I mean, not, it's yeah, not a federal case here. Yeah. And, and the other thing that Barry came out with, and for all you guys coaching young kids these days, he, he was saying that the average Kenyan kid at 17 has probably got 22,000 miles in their legs. Now that's only just like going to school, running, whatever. You see that up at I-10 or you see it out at the you know, all the time. Our kids no longer walk to school. They get in cars, they're on a computer, they're texting. And they're basically really... they're lazy. You, most people in this room probably got up in the school holidays at 9 o'clock and played the football game that was 64, 35, and come in at 8 o'clock in the evening, you're rushing at lunchtime, grab the sandwich to get back to the game. But They, well, they, they don't they, do that now. They, so, but these kids actually really run to school, run home for lunch, run back to school. They don't even think about it. It's just, they're not, you know, they're not bicycling, they're not picking mother in the car, they're not eating an ice cream, they're running. And when they get to high school, the kids that go, they have to pay. And one of the things, so they, they, see, they, one of the they things, take advantage of it. And one of the things you've got to do, I think, with our young kids, my brother coaches young kids at Birchville now, and we've looked at it over the last 12 months, and I've said to him, you stop pussyfooting around with these 12, 13, 14 year old kids, you've got to get them out running every damn day. Because you're playing catch up, because trust me, they're not doing anything else. The school system's down the tubes. They're eating crap. They text and sit around. They've got no social skills whatsoever because they can't actually talk to them. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All the kids are like, they text you and on the computer, but they actually can't front up to you and talk to you. And we've got to get these kids motivated and say, hey, great, come on. You've got to get out running every day. They'll do what you tell them. And, and we've got to stop messing about with them. And, and that's going to be a big push for us, I think, on endurance. Because basically, you're getting, you talk to someone like Mick Woods. Now, Mick's been hailed as a great guy, or he's been persecuted because he's whatever. But he's actually got the right idea. And he's done a great job at all the shot. Now, he's going to have some wastage and failures that don't make it. Just like they do in Kenya. Or Lydia did. Or Lydia did, or every great distance running coach. Not everybody <coughs> can become a great distance runner. My coach, he coached about 10 people, half of them were good, very good runners, the other half just fell by the wayside. And we've got to expect, we're going to have what you'd have to call expendable losses in this program, but we're going to have to get on top of this situation and make these kids far more active. See, we don't like we've that. We've got 18-year-old and 17-year-old kids go to Loughborough, St. Mary's, Birmingham University, the universities up here, they come to you, I'm a distance runner. Well, okay, right, you're 18 and distance runner. They run 20 miles a week. <laughs> My 89 year old mother could run 29 miles, 20 miles a week. It's a joke. And I'll tell you, my mum, my mum was there when Bannister ran the first sub four minute mile. She's got six kids, three of us made the Olympic team. And she's a funny old lady, sharp as a whip. She lives 800 metres from Alexander Stadium. Massive birch road that has you. She's down there two or three times a week on club nights. Now, half the kids that come in stay at my mum's house. If, if we've got a match on or whatever we're doing. And this is classic of my mum, who used to, he was used to Dave Bedford, myself, Alan Rushmer, 
all the great and the good of British dysentery training from the house on a Sunday. We used to have these big weekends. My mum will ring me up now, and she'll talk about some kid from the club, and she'll say, you know what, son, they're not training very hard, you know. And I'll go, yeah, right, well, okay. Yeah, but yeah, well, you know, you've got to look at this, you know, they're not training very hard. How do you know what they're doing? Well, I'm only washing one lot of kids a day. When you love a room, I was washing three lots of kids every day because you're running three times a day. So if I'm only washing one lot of kids every day, and they have a day off as well, they can't be training very hard, can they? Now, she has a point, actually, when you think of it like that. So in my mother's mind is, they just can't be doing very much. And she's only washing one lot of kids. And the other thing is, we, we have this idea that you know, that everybody needs to be told that they're equal. And everybody needs a trophy. And if you want love for Christ's sake, get a puppy. Mm. You know, a puppy will love you. Yeah. That is not the job of your coach. That's the job of a puppy. And your wife may not love you, your friends may not love you, but the damn puppy will if that's what you want. But the, the kids today think, you know, that, 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 that everybody has to be, get equal time and everybody has to equal love. It doesn't work that way. The world is not equal. It's not fair. And it, the sooner you learn that in life, the quicker you are going to be surviving, no matter what you're doing. And also, these kids <coughs> have got to be brought up to challenge you guys. That's right. My coaching lead was like war and peace from when I was 17 to 18 years old. Trust me, I would challenge him every damn step of the way. In 68, I was third in the Olympic trials. I was 18 years old at 5K. And I broke the world junior record. With it. I was so pissed off because I didn't go inside 13.40, I ran 13.41. Gordon Peary picked me up off the track telling me how great it was, I didn't even know who the heavy was. I just said, look, go away, leave me alone. I got back in the dressing rooms and he told me who he was and I sat down and spoke to him for three hours. I got on the train back from White City and my coach back to Birmingham. We are, he nearly came to blows. And I said to him, we're just not doing enough running. This is killing me. Hope to God they don't put me to Mexico because I'll never get through the rounds. I mean, bits running... 5k here, he's thinking what the hell is this idiot on about, he's just broken the world junior record, and I'm saying to him Jeff, we either change this training or I will change my coach and we argued for two weeks and it was like war and peace and I revamped the whole of the winter training program and just did it on my own those kids are going to have to challenge you, and it will make you better coaches too it's not just, oh this is how it is and my way and the highway, it's like Hang on a second. When they get to that level, you're going to learn as much from them as they should from you. And you should encourage them to do that. If you have to explain it to them, you're a better coach. You'll understand better what you're doing if you have to explain it to them. Not, not, not your buddy. To some 18-year-old. You can con your mother, you can con your grandmother, you can't con an 18-year-old. If you're a phony, they know it. Right now, there's the way. Time to 25, they've lost that skill, but they got it at 18. <laughs> and, and, and I think... You know, you've got to start looking at all those little things and, and telltale signs of these kids. If they're just taking what you say, parrot fashion, they're probably not going to really push you, and they're probably not going to push themselves either. I mean, I used to read every damn book I'd get my hands on. I read Ryan's book, Lydiard, both of them, Clark's books, uh, Piri, all of it. I was sort of eating this information. Then I'd go back and I'd say to my coach, well, why aren't we doing this? Because this guy... And I'd be questioning all the time. And it's, it's disseminating the information and then deciding... I can always remember a guy coming to me and he said, well, you know, Herb Elliott ran up and down sand dunes and he said, you know, do you do any sand dune work? I said, I live in the middle of the city of Birmingham. We don't have sand dunes, mate, but we do have canal towpaths. So that's where we try. Or stadium stairs, you can find another Exactly. Way. I said to him, you know what, I have the Vicky Hills, but we ain't got any sand. So you have to utilise what you've got. And I, I thought, well, well, you know, why is he asking me that? For Christ's sake, I'm in the middle of you've got so. And there's all those sort of things that I think you have to really pull out of it. And the other thing is... when you're a kid. Another thing is, is, is to understand where to put the talents. First of all, water runs downhill, as you all know, not uphill. Most athletes would like to run something less than they should run. Most people who run the 800s would be in the 15, most in the 15, the 5, most in the 5, the steeples, I'm not the 5, I'm assuming the 10. They, they, don't, they run the one that's easier of the two. And, the steeples, and I'll give you an example about picking the right thing. The steeplechase is a good example. You can't surge in the steeplechase because the damn thing has got barriers, right? And you can, you, assuming you can teach somebody to hurdle, you can teach almost any idiot to hurdle, but there are a few exceptions. Your, a steeplechase is basically 
equated to how fast you run 800 meters. Whether, you, whether you're a four minute model or a 14 flat 5,000 meter or maybe a 1330 today, the point is that's not turnover speed. If you want to put the kid in the steeplechase, it's got to have turnover speed. A 148 a half model will run the 805 because he's running a very short, small, and time chamber one is just different time, but the, the idea is the same. The point is he's not running very fast. He can't surge. And if he can't turn it over, he's dead. So, it's, and, 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 so when you put kids in, and that's the advantage today, which we didn't do so much in the old days. Now, we did take core muscle samples, but when you put a kid in an oxygen uptake of the chain, you take those core muscle samples, then you can find out, then you can find out where he belongs. But it's the pressure you put on decides whether he can race. You can have somebody there. We've all had athletes that are absolutely wonderful in training track. Oh. They can do everything you tell them, and they can't beat their mother on the track. They can't race. I mean, we, we've got some classic cases now that, that you, you all have, have seen. Is if you're badly in some Lancashire, where do you go from where they are right now? Now, <clears throat> no matter what they say, no matter how they argue, Barcelona was a disaster for Badley because, hey, if he didn't win, it was a disaster in my mind. And the way he ran, was a, it was outrageous. For, so for him and Lancashire, they just don't have the turn of pace or the wheels to win. And allow Spaniards to dictate a race like that. I'm sorry, you've got some serious issues. So you've got to say to yourself, <clears throat> where do they go from here? And to John's point, is, did they stick with the 1500 because they're some of the best of the British in we're in a little comfort zone. And in Lancashire's case, who I know can hurdle, why would you not run the steeplechase? Because if you listen to us in kind of altitude, we can probably get him down to 735 for 3K. Now, if you can run 735 and he's run about 146 for 800, he's got to get close to eight minutes. He's going to break eight minutes. minutes. Because now, if you can break eight minutes, or around about eight minutes, you can play. you're, in, you're, you're a play. player in the steeplechase. Because he sure as hell isn't a player in the 1500. Now, Badley couldn't hurdle to save his life just the way he runs. So he's got some bigger issues. Do you move to five? Now, he's already run 1320, but 1320 don't cut it in today's age. So he's got some... No, that, that's coming home on the second part of 10,000. Ne yeah. Negative splits, the 13 plus. That's yeah. right. And, and that's another thing. they got to run out of run negative splits. I've had this discussion with him, and one of the luckiest <coughs> things that happened to that lot is they didn't race Mo Farrow over 1,500 this year because it had taken that lot to pieces. Because I know he could have run 3.30 points in somewhere like Monaco. I ran him on a time trial, and this is the difference. If we've been convinced in the past how slow he was, I had him run a time trial at 1.45.5 in front of him out for 800. Now, he ran 3.33 last year for 1,500. In Barcelona, for his third race at 5K, he came home in 2.25 the last kilometre. And as we all know sitting there, that's not slow. There's probably only four guys in the world who can come home in 225, especially for your third race in a major championships. You know, so we've changed a lot of what he does, but what we've done is not hard. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's really, really simple. Well, why don't we let him ask some questions now? Can I, can I just pick up on what you're talking about, Father? Just to sort of backtrack five minutes from what you mentioned, you were doing 100 miles a week plus, plus big sessions. What is it about the, what he was doing then that was so wrong, as opposed to what in specifics? Terms? Was he doing it well, quality? Yeah, yeah, the one thing was just mileage by mileage sakes get you nothing. The, the one thing was duplicating the other. Yeah. So mm -hmm. he was doing the volume on, on the mileage. Then I'll tell you what the track session was because it will scare the daylights out of you. One of the track sessions he had written down when I first got involved, and was um, and we were at um, altitude to do this, was five times two thousand meters off a, a minute's recovery. And he started off, the first one was in 68 second laps. It just dropped 68, 67, 66, 65, 64. That was, then he had three minute recovery, four times 400 in 64, three minute recovery, and four times 400 in 63. So he's run 1,400 meters, basically. You know, that's a lot of running. So he would see that as a 10,000 meter session? Well, it's not even that. It's just oh, too That's slow. good for orthopedic surgeons, but that's not good for so running. So what you're advocating is less volume, more speed. And so, no, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, if, if we're running this volume down here, and we're doing 10 power runs, and, and, and we're hitting about 130 a week maximum at times, we don't need to be doing it again down here on the track. We need to be taking 
this back to about 90, 95 miles a week if you're running fives and tens. And we need to be doing things like the six, eight hundreds off, off three minutes. But you've got to be running sub 60 second laps. But he's also got to run in the morning so he's slightly tired. Oh, then, oh, you, got, get, then that, you get the effect. If you don't, you've got to run 20 or 30. Oh, you've got to run an hour in the morning. That's, that's why you've got to hard. get the volume in. So you've got to run an hour in the morning. The track sessions are 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Because if you don't do that, the point is that it's not like the race. You've got to get him slightly tired to run that hard volume. If you don't run that hard volume, and he hasn't and he hasn't run in the morning. It's not the same as effect as the race. And if you don't do anything in practice, you don't do it a race. It'll kill you. And the other thing they were doing was, which I, <coughs> I never understood, and I did ask some people who were looking after him the question on this. He would come to the track. The whole group that they were looking after would come to the track, and they'd warm up, and they wouldn't know what the session was until they warm, finished the warm up. And I just said, well, I just don't get it because. How many people in you have, have been runners? I mean, I should think there's quite a few of you that have been ex-runners, whatever. Mm -hmm. If I said to you, if I've carried, carried that philosophy to, through and I said, okay, you're going to come down the track, you're going to warm up, then I'll tell you what we're doing. You're going to go, shit, you know, what's, he, what's he going to say? Now, if I tell you he's 10 times 200 with a 200 metre jump, probably everybody in this room could do that. That wouldn't phase you at all, would it? If I said to you, right then, it's going to be six times 800 metres or 1,200 or even worse, three times one mile with a five minute recovery and I'm going to time the whole thing. Now you've got to get your head around that. For me to just drop it on you like that, I'm not going to get the best out of that session. And you don't go to the Olympics not knowing what yeah. you're doing, do you? I would, I would clarify that with just one thing. I, I, I have a tendency, remember you're a chemical machine. And that's what you are. And you're not the same every day. Okay? And this is where your coaching experience comes. I would say to the guy, we're going to run three to five of these, whatever they are. I could watch them after three and know they have no business running two more because it's going to cost them more up here than it's worth it. I would say it's a fine day and leave. And, and, and if you, because if you say, if you say I got to run five of them and there's no escape from the five and the kid runs lousy the last two, you got a problem. So the answer is get it range that you need and have enough sense to know that he may have done it on Tuesday, but you're watching today, who knows? Maybe it was all his girlfriend, maybe he had a beer. God knows what he had. As a girl, it might be that time in a month that it's not going to work this way. So you better, you better, I think you can learn as a coach that give them parameter. Don't change what they do. Tell them ahead of time. But if you tell them, if the system becomes a solution on the board every day, then you're, then you're bound by the system. And if the system doesn't work that day, and then, and then my memory, every, there are some guys that are pretty good runners, not like he was, was strong in the head. They're a little weaker in the head. They can still be good, but those kind can't do it on their own. They have to be told. Absolutely. And therefore, if, if you said you have to do five, and the coach said five, and I fall apart at four, you set yourself back. So you need to be able to do that kind of thing. And also, you see, I think with these kids, once you get into a certain level, they have to take ownership and responsibility right. for some of this themselves. And... And I don't think that Mo is hopeless at that. And, and we've got to change a lot. And uh, the, he's not out there on his own. There's a lot of our kids that, that, that are terrible at that. And um, I, I can remember before I ran the Commonwealth Games here in 70, which is a hell of a long time ago, and I was only 21 years of age. And my brother was running the 1500. And um, we, we had to come into Edinburgh 10 days before the, the meet. And I've got to take on Ron Clark, well, Record Hour and Kit Kino. You know, I was pretty ready for that. But I was still only the ninth fastest guy in the race. But we've got a guy called, I don't know if you Derek Gibbetson, who was World Rock Mile record all that. And he, I ran for Puma, and Derek was up. My coach couldn't come up for the other job. So we had to run this session of 16 500s with a minute recovery. <laughs> and this was about eight days off, off the games. And I was in shape. So we go down the track, and Derek's got the watch. And we start running this now. I'd normally run these in about 59 seconds. I'd average about 59, roughly. And it'd be my third session of the day, so I'd have run to work, I'd have run home, then I'd have gone back to the club at sort of 7 o'clock and run 16,400 with the group I trained with. We get on the track, and of course, I've been easing back. So we start running these 400s, and I'm running them in 58, and my brother's just hanging on. So I'm just hammering these things out, and they're dead easy. And I got to 10, and I just said, well, stop. 
And Derek saying, what do you mean you don't do 16? I said, no, stop. I said, I don't have to do 16. And my brother, I said, Pete, stop. We're not going to get better in the You're next seven to eight days. We're running these so easily. It's the best we've ever run them. But we don't need to run 16. That's right. Stop. We know <laughs> what we need to know. Let's just jog down and go home. I'll give you one other And that's because you've got to take ownership for that. Because the coach can't tell you that, especially if he's not there. But also, they get a little bit carried away. Oh, it's the best session we've ever done. We've got to do that. That's why I said before, you have to be told to know that. Screwed up major championships. Not because they've had like, bad runners, but because they've got even <coughs> too carried away with it. And you've got to understand, this year we had problems in Mo. Gary Locke looked after Mo for the last four weeks in front of Mo. Because I couldn't get up there, he got all the sessions, we were on daily contact. <coughs> and I said to him, the biggest problem you're going to have is holding him back. I said, for 10 days out, because he's never been, he's never done that, he's trained like hell right up to the event. No, I said, you've got to get the reins on him, and you've got to hold him right back, because he's got three big races. Gary was going, Christ, a bloody nightmare this is. I said, I know it is. You've got to hold him back. Only let him run once a day, easily. You need to understand that R E S T is a great training method. Absolutely. There's time to rest. Uh, as some of you might, I don't know what level coach you are, but if some of you have younger kids, that you can, one way you can teach them surging drills on the road too. You have, let's say you have a 10 mile course that they're going to run, and you tell, and you you get yourself some colored flags, good old English colors, red, white, and blue. And you, and you tell them that they're going to start at, say, 72 or 60. I don't care what the pace is. They're going to run until they get to a flag. If the flag is white, they keep running that same pace because they have no idea when you're running. If I'm running with you and I decide to leave, I'm not going to tell you how long. If they meet a blue flag, they drop it two seconds. If it's a red flag, they slow it down two seconds. They have no idea what they're going to do until they see the flag. Because in the race, like I said, he's not going to say to me, Oh, by the way, John, I'm going to run 1,000 meters. I'm going to drop it two seconds. You don't know that. So the answer is, it's for younger kids to learn. That's a good way to do it. When they're running as a bunch of kids out there, you, and colors are relevant, but my point is that they know one is what the pace you tell them to start at. And they say, how long? Well, you're going to run to get to a flag. And then you're going to drop it two seconds till you get the next. It might be 400 meters. It might be 1,200 meters. It might be 1,000 meters. It, it'll vary or any odd distance you want. The point being is, that's what they'll learn what a race is like. Because in a race, no one is going to tell you when they're going to go, how they're going to go. And, you, and it, it's a simple one with younger runners, you can help. The older ones don't need that. But young ones is, is a group. It's a, some kind of a thing, because they like, at that age, <coughs> something that they can get tangible. And those flags become tangible to them. And, and one of the things that, that teaches you, like what John is saying, and we've, got, we've got obsessed with time now. Yeah, All these pace that. races, yeah. everything's got about the time, the whole thing. You know... I was brought up where it's actually about winning races. That's what counts. I was not a great runner, I was just a good racer. <laughs> I have to be a right handful if you're going to race me. And this is about winning races. And we're, I've seen so many of it, and, and that's another thing like with Tomo and Mo, teaching them, you know what, you've got to win this. Forget the time, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you cross the line in 14.30, so long as you're the first guy across the line. That's the business we're in. All of us, it's about winning. And they've got to learn their craft. That's one of the most helpful things you can do. And if, if you look at the big Grand Prix now, we, we're more and more taking pacemakers out, I, I'm trying to. Or we'll put one in just to get it moving to sort of 800 and that's it, we take them out. Um, because, you know, some of our runners, they haven't, you, you look at them, I'll tell you now, <coughs> Lisa de Brisky hasn't got a clue. If George doesn't tell that girl what to do, it's almost like George running her buddy. He's got plan A, plan B, and if plan C comes up, she's screwed. Barcelona showed you that. She can't think on her feet at all, Lisa, because George has drilled into her that he's so much better at it than her. I mean, we've argued like hell till dawn, George and I. I said, George, just don't tell her anything. Get on with it. Mo Farrow before Barcelona, they're all going, what are you telling him? I said, I'll tell you what I tell him. Told him nothing. He's down the warm up area. I said, he says, all right, boss. I said, careful of any nasty surprises. He went, got it. That was it. Well, I had all coaches have a fetish. My one is lane one. 
I don't want to see your dead ass in lane one unless you're 50 meters in the front. That's a sure as hell way. That lane yeah. one and a half to two is a nice place to be. Your ass doesn't end up on the ground. You know, these guys, and it's more with women than men. I mean, we used to have a girl in the United States called Sarah Swab. Remember her? Yeah. And we, when they rang the bell in the last lap, like Pavlov's dog, she bolted for the line for the for the pole. And, and that's right. And and, and I but I must have disqualified her as a referee three or four times. She took down the field a half a dozen more. Right. The point is, you watch women; they all run in lane one. There's 35 of them in a race, and they're all still in lane one. And they all want to be there. And Get out of there! It's not the shortest distance. It's a disaster. I'm not sure that's entirely true. <laughs> <laughs> well, men, men do it too, but oh, not to the same degree. Do, trust me. Can we get another question from the floor? Sure, please? any questions you like. Come on, guys, you got to have something. We're, we're, we won't bite. You said that uh, Americans are starting to look at changing their attitude as well, perhaps going higher, sending some of their athletes. Yeah, we, we, we've, we've had well. for years, uh, like the group with Larson and uh, mm -hmm. those, they, they do it in men, but. But now under Salazar and his project, he is going to Kenya, but he has an unlimited, limited amount of money, Nike, okay? Mm -hmm. And Phil Knight will give Alberto anything he wants. There is no money. He's more on the same program yes, as we are. That's right. And, and the United States needs to do more of it, but you have to understand, all our money for our, all our athletics, there is no government support. It is all private. We have the, the government, the only thing the government does during the Olympic trials, they put out a coin in and some stuff that money that's sold to that goes back to the Olympic Committee, which we see very little of, you know. But uh, so all our money in our system, it's the collegiate system. Uh, we, we have a we have a large pyramid, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of tracks here around the United States and colleges. And to give you an example, the major conferences, that come, like the men and what, what you're talking about, Big Ten, Pacific Ten, these are schools, eight or ten schools. They will spend if they if they have ten teams, they will the, besides paying for the kids' scholarship, which means is they will spend a million dollars per team. Okay, now our federation budget's about fourteen fifteen million dollars, believe it or not, and every one of those conferences spends more money, and they own facilities. Federation owns those facilities, so we we have lots of innovation in the United States. We have a lot of bad people, but the point is because the pyramid is so big that it rises to the top. As I was saying earlier, there will be people that I that I only know, slightly know, who next year, even though I've been running this thing for 35 years, will make the Olympic team and get a medal, and I have never heard of them to this point. Not at distance races in general. That's, but, that's for sure. but in the sprints and the hurdles and the jumps, they just, they're there, and tons of volume. And, and to our point, we, I mean, if, if you look at where we are with endurance now, some of the things that we're trying to do I mean, we brought outside money in to do the altitude camps and yeah. we're trying to get coaches up there. I mean, how many coaches in here have been to an altitude centre and know about altitude? Well, I've been, but I don't know what Exactly. <laughs> so what we're trying to do, Barry... We have a good kid, they got to go. They don't we're ever we're trying to put a working man's handbook together on altitude, because this should have been done 30 years ago. Yeah. We've been going since 1967 in odds and sides and bits and pieces. We've got... Medical care, we're the only outfit in the whole lot of, of UKA that's got medical backup for non-funded athletes. Because at the end of the day, you guys, we are so special, we're not short on numbers. And we are so different to everybody else. I've got Charles and Colin saying, oh, you've set this up now and it's like this private uh, club. I said, yeah, it's called Endurance, and we're all part of it. I'm not interested. He says, oh, yeah, but you know, the hammer and that lot of special. I said, well, you tell the guy who's doing the hammer, he can go and tell him they're special. Because I, I said, it's a circus event as far as I'm concerned. His job. <laughs> His job. <laughs> Get on with it. We draw the line here because I was the head coach and every, every yeah. event is a point, so I we, like them all. <laughs> we, we've got <laughs> this to do, and that's what I was employed to do. This is the meet director. And we control, I mean, we control the events, we control the meets, the kind of racing that we actually need. We're never going to get it better than this as it is right now for the next four or five years. This is going to be as good as it gets for British endurance running. We have to take maximum advantage of this, all of us. And we need to get as much outside sourcing, which is why we're saying to Aviva, oh, come to Farnham Road, come to Canada, question here. go and film it, go and look at it. Here's, here's a question here first, and then we'll over here. Yeah, it's specifically about uh, Britain and the, the issue about you, you were raising there about winning, which I you know, totally agree with the object is to win. What do you, how do you feel about the VNC series in terms of pace 
races and, and that, how does it fit into that sort of idea? I, I think the BMC have done a great job in, in what I'd call the, the dark ages of keeping the whole thing going. In fairness to them, they've done a fantastic job. What I'm trying to persuade them to do, I understand like there's some of the senior runners who are trying to get a time either qualifying at the championships or, or for the, the world champs or whatever. <coughs> that has a, a place. But for the younger kids, I don't think we need all these pace races. I'd rather see these kids learn to race and sort of take all that out. When, when, when I'm, I'm sitting there watching BMC 12, 13 year olds, and mum and dad say, well, what's the pace of the pace I do? And I think, Christ, you've lost the plot here. How about, <laughs> sweetheart, get out and run and beat their ass. Just go and win the damn thing. That's a starting point to me, because that gives the kids that little bit of edge to them. Not coming forth and saying, oh, well, I ran a PB today and it was a great time. I hate the word personal best. Yeah. I, I hate that. So I hate what? That, that lactic threshold. Oh, yeah, yeah no such thing. That. Jesus. It's interesting you raise that when, you know, there's this big program that's going on in, in London boroughs and is due to be brought up, up here about having competitions for sc between school based on PBs. Not in who wins, but based on PB. Well, it's not like this, this non-competitive sport nonsense, isn't it? Life's competitive, for goodness sake. <coughs> so why wouldn't sport... A, 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 mark, a mark like a personal best mark is only good if you're trying to, if, if, if you need a feel of 20 and you have no rational way but to take in a ranked order. But that becomes a little later than you first start. Yeah, know? I mean, what do you want to be? Do you want to be Olympic champion or world record holder? Because you're always going to be Olympic champion, but you're not always going to be a world record holder, right? It's as simple as that. So if you want a fast time, I mean, you know, I, I get... But like you don't run for the anyway. time, you run to win and you'll get the time. Does that mean that the discussion you're having with BMC mm -hmm. is, may, may lead to a different approach from there? Yeah, I'm trying to get them to take a, 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 an approach of, let's be a country of winners. Let's be a country of great winners. That'd you know, be a good start. As opposed start. to a country of good losers. And being happy to lose. When Jenny Meadows walks off the track in Barcelona and is happy with the bronze medal, I'm not happy. No, not when you just got bronze. You got a bronze medal in the world champs, and now you've slumped to a bronze medal at the European champs. Actually, how about you should have been winning that damn thing? And if you didn't, I'd be pretty pissed it's off. It's real simple. Sister, second is like kissing your sister or brother. That's about right. <laughs> winning. Thank you. I think there was, oh, me, there was him Sorry, first. Sorry, it was related to the point there. When you've got a group of athletes, they're all about the same age, and you've got a range of competitive levels. How do you tell them you're the only winner when somebody else is finishing further back? Where do people well, well, you don't. You let, them, you, you let them sort that out themselves, don't you? can you? train them in groups that are equal, but then when they have to race, they have to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. But you can, you should train them in groups of equality. If you yeah. put some kid in a race with, you have five good runners and you toss in Joe who should be running in the B group, yeah. right away you're going to kill Joe. When Joe's been running a while, you've got to force him into that group mm -hmm. bit by bit. Mm -hmm. But when you step on the track, not, but you do need to run as a team. And if you, you cannot run as an individual runner in distance running unless you want to get beat these days. Because the, when you run against Ethiopian, Kenya, there's three of them. There's a young one who's being sacrificed, so the other two are going to win. Yeah. So if you decide to, to... I had a couple of kids in the 2000, a kid named uh, Meb, was, and, and uh, Abby, yeah, was yeah. Two, average runner. Uh, we get over there to, to, uh, to Australia, we're there for six weeks in Australia, in the middle of nowhere, and these guys tell me they're just happy to be there. And, and, and of course I lost my marbles, we mean you're happy to be here. So I changed their training and told them what they were going to do in the first round, how they're going to do it, what they're going to do. They, they both made the first round. They made the final. That's the first time two Americans had ever made the final, and 10,000 when they ran heats. And they set, and they set the, their best marks ever in the final, and they were seventh and eighth. But the point being is, the point being is, they ran as a team. The other guy, who was a much better runner, was going to do it his own. Guess where he ended up? But I don't mean the, oh. the team aspect. Oh. You've got three individuals and they're at different competitive levels. Every track race there's going to be eight competing. There's only going to be one winner. But you have to say something to the other athletes that are well, you do, and, and further down as well. You, so you, you do. I'm but saying you just can't have that single no, 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 must we, win. We, we agree with you. We're just simply saying I agree that you want to win. If he gives yeah. us his best shot, you tell him it's his best shot. Yeah. But in the end, the answer is that you are here to win. Yes. 
you know, the, but the, this is the, the real crunch of it. Somebody's yeah. got to win, and he's got. In my, I always used to think somebody's got to win this. I mean, my brother used to argue like hell over, over this issue, and I used to say, you might as well be me. Yeah, the question. He yeah. 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 yeah, one back here. Yeah, the questions for Ian. Obviously, Ian was a professional cyclist as well. It was just to find out is there other things we can learn from other endurance sports as well that we could maybe bring into. Uh, I think the biggest thing I learned from when I was doing that was was probably taking a longer break than I did when I was an a runner. The cyclists tended to take four or five weeks off, and, and I think you learn that it's not a physical break; it's more of a mental break. You just need to have a break and just get away and do something totally different. And um, that was probably the biggest thing, I, I would single thing I learned. Everything else as far as I was concerned, the cycling, my pulse rate went up and I rode a shitload of miles, I can tell you. A lot more than most of them. And I was a very good domestic kind of team called Hebo Flanger. But everything else I felt, I mean these guys, are, they're not athletes, they're almost like spastics. They can hardly walk, they can't jog, you know. They can ride a bike and that's about what they do. But that, they're honest enough but, to tell you that. But it's competitive. It, it is very, very competitive. But it's, and now, that is a sport. I mean, I was, we had a big, it, it was a road team. So it's a massive, so you can't win without a team in cycling. Mm. And that, that, that nearly drove me insane, I have to say, because I should never play team it's, 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 it's But it's learning. If yeah. you kind of cram for the final versus study three hours a day, three hours, two days from now, three hours, three days from now, it, it, it compounds it. It's that kind of idea. So you want to build on the base and compound it. If you try to do it all at once, it's good. If you try to do everything in one weekend, it won't work. But there are times you need a rest, then you start over, but you don't lose the base. Of course, you do something over it, then you start again. I mean, one of the things I'll tell you what you want to look at is professional boxing. And if you look at big professional boxing, those guys probably train for a big fight, you know, for about 13, 14 weeks. That's it. And they're ready. Now, it's a whole different sort of fitness, but you can't say they're not fit. <laughs> well, they're fit. But they only probably train for about a 13 to 14 week cycle for a big world championship fight. They go to one of these training camps and they really hammer it in. But it's just about 13 to 14 weeks, so it's not like what we do. And the cyclists, they go on these big training camps and they do do a lot of, a lot of riding. But it's, it's not comparable with what we do. Don't let anybody kid you that. If you want some time out and just go and relax and just keep injury free, because you will do all of that. It's different muscle groups, the whole thing. But the psychological bit of it's very good, I think. But because it's a team, I mean, I'm just hopeless at team sports, because the price is so good. I've, I've been on the World Cross team. you don't play well. No, I don't play well. I've been on the World Cross team when Scotland should have won it, and we finished third. <coughs> and Jimmy Older was the team captain, and he hit... He smacked it in the cap of the, he really lost it. You wouldn't get it now, he got him by the throat and just punched him. And then he knocked him out. That's how pissed off Jim was. Because <laughs> McCafferty was 95th and we should have won the damn thing. And that, that was at Cambridge in 72, I think. I was third that day. But, and Jimmy was 18. And I, I, I was sitting there, I got badly spiked. I'd lost the race anyway, so I was pretty pissed off. And I was trying to get. Have you ever noticed those St. John guys, they're always big fat guys? <laughs> <laughs> they are, aren't they? They're yeah. big fat guys. And I've got these big, uh, I've got a big rip up my leg. I've still got the scar. Now I'm saying to him, just put some stitches in it, mate. And Jimmy come past me and I says to him, where do you go, Jimmy? So I was 18th. Now we've got McCafferty, Lackey Stewart, myself, Dick Wedlock. We've got a very good team and the English were crap. And uh, I thought, well, if, and I'm sitting there, I think, well, if Jimmy was 18th, that's four of us got to be in 18. Got to have been in 18. We were in with a shout of winning this. He comes back about 20 minutes later. I said, How are you done, son? And Kathy was 98. And he said, I don't know. We ended up third. And uh, <coughs> he, he got in this. The Scottish management had, um, had decided we were going to win it so easily, they got a champagne reception. <laughs> which, of course, by the time we got there, turned into a wake. <laughs> <laughs> so Jimmy being the team. <coughs> Jimmy B and Jimmy had a few too many champagnes and then he said about the cafe thing, we ended up with a fucking thing. How bad can this get, you know? But that was how passionate he was about it. I think we've probably got time for a couple more questions and then the yes. guys have got to get to technical meetings, so two more. You've upset, you've upset a few people, I've offered a few feathers, I think that's fair to say since you took the job. 
if there's one thing you would like to get across to endurance athletes, one thing you could, if you could change something tomorrow that everybody had to do. It's, it's just the work ethic, you know, it's having a big work ethic, it's not this less is more philosophy, you know, whatever way round you do it, and I'm not saying, I don't know it all, I don't have all the answers, we have a great team of people now, what, whatever happened in Barcelona, trust me, was not down to me, that was down to the whole UKA setup, from Barry Fudge, to Andy Jones, to Gary Locke, to Mark Rollins, to Spencer Bard, and they did a huge amount of work on it, you know, to, to George, to John Nuttall, all these people played a significant role in what happened in Barcelona. So it's not down to me, sure, and it's not about me either, it's about British endurance distance running. And, and, and the big thing is to have a massive work ethic, and we've just got to step up and do, you know, ramp up the workload. Look at Mick Woods, he's a shining example. Those girls are in 80, 90 mile a week. They're not messing about. I mean, I'll tell you now, if you look at people little Charlie Perdue, she's half the size she was this time last year. She's as fit as hell. Emma Pallant, Christ, I wouldn't want to raise Emma Pallant, she'd probably punch her. She's a really, really tough kid, Emma Pallant, and a hell of a talent. But you've got kids like that. We've all got... I, I sat somewhere and said, oh, we, we, I was in Belfast, this guy says, well, we don't have those sort of tough kids. And I said, you're in Belfast, you don't have tough kids. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't believe it because you're not looking in the right places. I don't believe that in Scotland we haven't got tough kids. It's just instilling in them, this is what we've got to do and how, how badly do you want it. And that's, that's basically what it is. We do have an issue that is getting more and more of a middle class sport. Well, if you if you're asking me if I'll take a poor kid over a middle class kid, you bet your life I will every day. Because I got a hook on the kid to keep teaching to start with. It, it, it's interesting. He can afford to go and have a Coca Cola and go home and talk to his mother and cry. He's probably not going to do any good. And, and the American philosophy is very good actually, because I was sitting at um, European indoors in what was that 2007 in Birmingham with my then partner and my now wife. And she was sitting there, and, and John, John knows her very well. I'm not responsible, I told you that. He actually introduced me to her. I'm not responsible. And, um, but Steph was sitting there next to me, and she said, and she's president and chair of USA Track and Field, and she said she was looking at our lot, and basically the sprinters more than anything else, and she said, you know what? She said, you've got a team full of pretty boys, and I've got a team full of scrappers. Give me my scrappers over your pretty boys any day. And I walked away and I thought, you know what? She's bloody right, because they're just too soft. You know, they're getting all this funding, these relay squads and all this crap, and they're all driving these flash cars. How about getting out there and producing goods? And we're not that bad, but we've got to get kids, you know, back to where we should be getting kids. And to your point, if you went to Birchfield, they ain't got middle class kids there. They've got kids out of Hansworth. Hansworth's like Harlem. I mean, I was born, I come from Hansworth. That's right next to Virtual and Harriers. Trust me, they've got street kids in that club. Most of them from single parent homes. They, are, they have got a lot of tough little kids out there. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and that's a way out for a lot of these kids. And, and it's not to say that they upper class, middle class kids on, and you look at Andy Badley, tries the double first at Cambridge. You know, the, the, you've got to take the cross section, but we've got to just toughen them up and, and give them that work for us. But with the poor kids, if you can get a hook at them, so you can get them to buy into it, so you can channel that energy in a positive way, they, they are tough enough. The, the, problem is, the, the problem is that 99% of them have no guidance of any kind. The mother's not door, 